All right, I think it's uh, time to start. So uh, we wish to welcome you to the eighth presentation in the new lecture series of the Liebethal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies for the fall of 2023. Uh, my name is Per Kassel. I teach modern Chinese history at the history department. The complete series schedule is available here today and on the China Center's website. Uh, email remembers are sent out weekly for the lecture series. Uh, I'm going to start with a few announcements. On Thursday, November the 16th at 6 p.m. on the 10th floor of Weiser Hall, that is where we are today, uh, right now, the China Ongoing Perspective film series will present Anda Union, From the Steps to the City, a film on the vibrant culture and music of Inner Mongolia. It will be followed by a Q&A with discussant assistant professor Sangseraima Ujid or d'oeuvre from the Everest Sherpa restaurant will be served. The next presentation of the fall uh, 2023 LRCCS new lecture series will take place on Tuesday, November the 28th, uh, and will be given by Otto Chui Chao Lin, senior advisor to the president and vice chancellor at Hong Kong Baptist University, uh, who will be speaking on Lao Tzu's perspective on innovation. Please note that there will be no lecture next week, uh, Tuesday, November the 21st, due to the Thanksgiving break. I will now proceed to introduce today's speaker. Uh, today's presentation will be given by Kenneth Swope. Dr. Swope is Professor of History, Senior Fellow of the Dale Center for the Study of War and Society at the University of Southern Mississippi, and Senior Project Advisor for the Aftermath Project at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. He holds an MA in Chinese Studies uh, and PhD History degrees from the University of Michigan. He is the author and editor of numerous books on late imperial China, including Struggle for Empire, The Battles on General Zhou Zongtang, forthcoming from the Naval Institute Press in 2024. He is currently researching a book on the rebellion of the three feudatories, uh, scheduled for publication in 2026. Uh, today he will be speaking on trickle-down Confucianism, war reconstruction, and cultural assimilation in the late Qing. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? I presume you can, right? Pretty loud. All right, well, it's great to be back in Michigan again. Um, so many changes. So I was walking around campus this morning and going to the Asia Library and seeing how plush things are over there compared to back in the day when we had to toil away and dark and lonely place, uh, but you know, wonderful uh, setting up here today, so hopefully I can uh, do it justice. And um, as Parr was talking, this, uh, today's uh, uh, talk is going to concern uh, trickle-down Confucianism, which is basically the way I'm interpreting it here. This is Zhao Zongtang's plans for rehabilitation in, um, in China all over, but I'm particularly going to focus on the Northwest and his wars against the, uh, the Dungan Muslim rebels and against Yaqub Beg, who was the emir of Kashgiria briefly in the 1860s and 70s. And this is part of my larger project, which, as I mentioned, is a biography of Zhao Zongtang. So we will get to that here. Let's see if this works. OK, so funny story is, as some of you probably know, I'm really a Ming historian, like a Ming-Qing transition person. So most of my work has been 16th, 17th century. But for whatever reason, as, as for a long time, when, when people found out I studied Chinese history, they would always ask, oh, really? You know, random people would ask about the General Cao guy, right? General Cao, General Zhuo, et cetera. Right? And I always kind of thought, I was kind of jokingly said, well, maybe one day I'll write a book about him and you'll know who he is. And so as it turned out, um, 2015, I was a visiting researcher at IAS at Princeton. And uh, I was in a Middle Eastern restaurant of all places. And these grad students next to me were talking. And there was like an Asian grad student and three others. And they asked him about General Cao. Is this guy a real guy? And he's like, oh, no, he just made him up for the Chinese dish. And I'm saying, I, and then I leaned over and I said, actually, he is a real guy. And I, and I started talking to them. And they didn't really care. But, um, but at least I informed them of this. And around that time, this uh, movie had come out. Uh, the Search for General Zhao, which was a Netflix movie about the, the chicken dish, right? About General Zhao's chicken. And uh, so I watched the movie, 
And you know, it was really about finding the chicken dish and the, the chef who invented it in New York City and stuff like that. But they actually go to, to General Zhao's hometown at one point and they ask all these Chinese chefs in China about this and no one knew what it was. Right? They didn't know what General Zhao's chicken was. Um, and I said, I really have to write this book now. I really must do it. And I figured, oh, it'll be easy, right? It'll be no problem, 19th century. Everybody knows a lot about the 19th century. Um, and, uh, and so uh, there was also a book published around the same time called Fortune Cookie Chronicles by Jennifer Lee, which is about Americanization of Chinese food. And so she has a chapter on General Zhao's chicken in there. So there are all these kind of pop culture references, but I wanted to tell the real story of the real historical figure, which I've, I thought would be relatively easy. But unfortunately, and those who do the late Qing know this, compared to the late Ming, there are just way too many damn sources. Uh, to study and master. And so like the first thing I did is I found, uh, because General Zhao's 200th birthday was in 2014, the anniversary of his birth, and matter of fact, his birthday is November 10th, so it was just last week, which is one of the reasons I'm doing the talk this week. It's the closest I could get to General Zhao's birthday. But, um, but as in part of the anniversary of that, they republished his collected works in China in 2014, and I picked him up, you know, 15 volumes, five to 600 pages each, of classical Chinese, right? And everything is in there, right? Letters and memorials and correspondences and funerary inscriptions and poems. And, and, and so I quickly realized it was going to be a lot more difficult to do this book than I thought, just with that, right? Because you get a Ming Chuanji and it's like two volumes, three volumes, you know, whatever, one volume, much shorter, much shorter to do that, this Qing stuff. And then on top of that, you have the Western newspaper accounts, uh, accounts of all the things that are involved. And then Zhuo, since Zhuo was a commander for 30 years, from 1850 to the 1880s, right, you have all those military campaigns he participated in. So you have the historical records from the Taiping Rebellion, the Nian Rebellion, the Dungan Rebellion, the, uh, the Muslim Rebellion in Xinjiang, the uh, Sino-French War, and, you know, and again, the Fang Lue just run into, like the Fang Lue for the Shangan Xinjiang War alone, 30 volumes, average of five to 600 pages each. I read every one of them all the way through. And, uh, and so I'm not doing any more late Qing stuff. There's just too much out there. So what you're gonna get today is a small slice of some of the insights from the book as a whole pertaining, particularly because what I found was very interesting about him is that he had a very consistent approach to statecraft and to governance that was derived from his youth, from his training, uh, from his own personal experience that really permeated his entire official career as a military and as a civil official. And he was a very consistent person. And he was also very interesting because he so much encapsulates the kind of late Qing as a whole in that he's a reformer, but he's also pretty conservative. And he truly believed in the power of Confucianism to rejuvenate society. And, and his idea was that the problem is we need to embrace Western technology to an extent, but Confucianism needs to be the core, right? So, you know, Zhang Zhidong and some of these other guys get credit for this, but it was really Zhao who kind of pushed this at an earlier stage, derived from his own readings of Wei Yuan and people in the early 19th century. And so that's kind of the, the sort of theme we're going with here. So. So of course that, right? we all know what that is, right? Had to have a picture of General Zhao's chicken here. And, uh, and so this, uh, the book will be out with the Naval Institute Press uh, early next year. It's just, I finished the uh, page proofs this weekend. So, so uh, they tell me it's, our, it's going into copy or to indexing next. So it'll be out early next year, Naval Institute Press. And uh, that is a cover. And that, that image is actually a battle, uh, that's battling the Nian rebels. And so I think they, it's from a museum up in Canada, I think Alberta, whatever the Alberta Museum has this image of the, the Qing fighting the Nian. And so here's a portrait of Zhao. One of the other great things about the late 19th century is that you have photography, right? So we actually have photographs of Zhao and Li Hongzhang and Zhang Guofan and some of these people. So this is one of, the, uh, uh, of his, uh, when he was out in Gansu, him as the uh, governor general out there. All right. So, uh, and this pertains specifically to what I'm going to talk about today in dealing with the reconstruction of uh, Gansu and Xinjiang and Shanxi in the wake of the uprisings there. And a famous Qing mantra, there is no distinction between Han and Hui. There are only good and bad people. 
And um, some modern biographers have attributed this statement to Zaw himself because he uttered it frequently. But in fact, when I was doing my research and reading the Fang Lue, the Daoguang Emperor was saying this in the 1850s about incursions into Central Asia from uh, in, into Kashgaria and these areas into Xinjiang um, in, in that period. So he did, Zhao Zengtang did not invent that statement. It was official Qing policy at least from the 1850s, if not earlier. But as, you know, as the rulers of a multi-ethnic empire, they were keen to try to balance the different interest groups while also recognize, of course, that the Han are the majority. And so this is something I'm gonna come back to in the, uh, in the course of, of the uh, discussion as we go on today. Oops, oops, sorry. Went too fast. Okay, so this is just a map of the Qing Empire. And um, so you can see the whole Qing Empire here. And we'll be talking about uh, Shangan, Shanxi, Gansu there, and Xinjiang, the Muslim uprisings in those two areas. But uh, uh, this is one of the maps from the book. I like the mountains in there, they look good. Right. <clears throat> I have a good cartographer. All right, so uh, Zhuo was a native of Xiangyan, Hunan, and uh, he was from an academic family, but his father and grandfather were the lowest, uh, like the Shotsai level. And, uh, but they were rather poor, and so they had to do a lot of their own like farming and things like this. But he was, from a young age, he was inculcated in the Confucian classics, but also in practical learning and things like this. So he was very interested in stuff like agriculture, strategic geography, thing, uh, those sorts of subjects. He was a huge fan of Wei Yuan, who publishes you know, sort of strategic geographies of the, of the Northwest and the coast and other things in the 1820s. And so Zaw passes the, um, he passed the exam for the lowest degree in 1826, and he earns the Juren degree in 1832 at the age of 20. And so he, and he was ranked very high in, the, in his class of Juren. However, he never passes the Jinshur degree. He never gets it. Right? So he tries three times and fails. Three times in the 1830s, he attempts to take the Jinshur degree and fails. Uh, the popular story is that in one of them, there were some of the examiners that wanted to pass him, but others thought that his, uh, his writing style was too pedantic and too ordinary, and they didn't want him, they, they, they rejected it, right? And, um, and he was not, and his exam essays have survived, they're in his collected work, so if you want to read them, you can read them. And, he, and again, it's interesting because he talks about a lot of practical things, about state and society renovation, about taking care of the common people, about teaching them things like farming and stuff. He himself, when he fails the exams a couple of times, he decides to become this recluse, sort of scholar farmer, calls, him the, calls himself the old man of the Xiang River, and starts like writing agricultural manuals and things, and then going out into the countryside and working with peasants to like learn how they like grow rice and stuff like this. So he's really kind of invested in this, and it's one of his, his kind of personal interests. And then he'll eventually get a job as a, as a tutor, which I'll talk about here in a second. But I think the key part here is that he's strongly influenced by this wave of geostrategic literature and renovation literature that emerges in the early 19th century in the Qing, right? And so, you know, the old narratives that the Qing was totally in decline and they didn't know what was going on from the you know, White Lotus Revolt on, but as many of you probably know, there's a lot, been a lot of revision to that in the last couple of decades with the realization that in fact, the Qing rulers and a lot of the officials, military officials, et cetera, were very aware that changes need to, needed to be made in government and you know, social organization, et cetera, and there were people interested in solving these problems. There were a lot of other problems involved with factionalism, et cetera, that we can talk about at some other point, but, but Zhao was clearly influenced by this as a young man, and, believe, and he sincerely believed that a kind of Confucian-oriented society taking care of the masses itself was, was the key to uh, social renovation and, and, and the survival of the Qing, right? So um, his parents both died when he was fairly young, and uh, so, and he got married right around the time he got his Juren degree. So he had a family to support, so he became, like a lot of these people did, he became a tutor, right? And he, he got a job as a tutor to Taoju, who was the viceroy of Diangjiang in the 1830s. And this was important because, and this will be a, another theme in Zhao's life, he acquired powerful contacts as a result of this. So Taoju was well connected in Hunan society, and he introduces Zhao to a number of other luminaries 
who were you know officials already in the in Hunan or in other places of China, but they were all Hunan natives. And so so he had studied at Yuelu Academy, Yuelu Shusha, and um, he makes a lot of contacts that will then benefit him later in life. And so among other things, this teaches him the values of thrift and concern for the people. And he was doing this when the Opium War broke out. So when the Opium War breaks out, the first Opium War with British, uh, Zhao is working as a tutor. And, um, and it's really interesting because he wasn't a, actually an official at this time, but he corresponded with a lot of people who were. So we know he was very enraged by the results of the Opium War and, and what it meant for the Qing and what it meant for China as a whole. He developed a lifelong animosity for the British as a result of the Opium War. So later in life, even though he would work with foreigners, he preferred the French and the Russians. He never, he, he would say this, he goes, you can't trust any foreigners really, but the British are the worst. Right? You really can't trust the British. You know, if you have to work with them, work with the French or the Russians, right? was, was his kind of opinion. So he would still work with them, but the British in particular, he did not trust right? as a result of the Opium War. And so for those of you who don't know, right, this is just a brief uh, selection of the major uprisings and wars of 19th century China in the Qing. So some of them uh, which get a lot of credit, some of them which don't get as much um, coverage. But, um, you know, so Zhao himself is directly uh, involved in the Taiping Rebellion, the Nian Rebellion, um, the uh, Dongan Revolt, and Jakub Begg's uprising, and the Sino-French War. So he participates in all of those directly. And then the other ones, of course, are around the fringes. I mean, the Arrow War and stuff are around the fringes, uh, for him at least. But this just gives you a sense of what the Qing had to deal with in the 19th century. So one of the themes of my book is actually, it's amazing that the Qing survives all of this and still lasts for you know, another 30 years after it, you know, given the you know, tremendous strains. And in fact, during the course of the 19th century, the Qing managed to initiate a number of reforms, including tax reforms. They increased their revenue tremendously from 1830 to 1911, in terms of how much revenue they're bringing in. Because of Li Jin and different uh, other taxes and other reforms, they build at least the vestiges of a military. They build a modern navy. Obviously, things happen with that navy, which I'm not going to talk about today, but but that, that's part of it. So a lot of different things are going on that Zaw is a part of, right? And so this, is, I mentioned, he develops a dislike for the English, but he develops a lot of contacts or correspondence with officials concerning uh, military affairs and current events, and he presents himself as a sort of gentleman farmer. And um, he also uh, becomes more and more upset as, in the aftermath of the Taiping Rebellion, as social unrest spreads through South China, right? It spreads through Guangdong, it's in Guangxi, it's going all over, and Zhao itself, he, he one, uh, multiple times because of bandit incursions in his neighborhood, he moves his family up into the mountains to retreat from these bandit incursions that are you know, not directly connected to the Taipings, but connected to general social unrest. And this is another theme of this entire era, is that Chinese society as a whole becomes heavily militarized in the 19th century, because as government, the government ability to kind of run things breaks down, they encourage, or at least don't stop, the formation of Tuanlian, of local militia units, that, that sometimes they're just local gentry will put them together, or families will put them together. So pretty soon, all over the country, no matter where you're at, there are these self-defense organizations, and they will often get into conflicts with each other. And later we'll talk about how this happens in the Northwest, because the Muslims and the Han will create their own competing self-defense organizations that flare up into outright rebellion in the 1860s. Um, also, interestingly enough, uh, Zhuo was a big fanboy of Lin Zexu. And so, of course, Lin Zexu, the official responsible for the, um, you know, partly responsible, at least, for the Opium War. And he gets exiled to Xinjiang. But uh, he's brought back within a few years to deal with the Taiping Rebellion. And so on his way back, he had gone to another position first, and then they were going to send him to Guangxi to battle the Taipings after they had won a few battles. And on his way to Guangxi from, I think it was in Fujian, he, he and, and Zhao Zongtang have like an all-night meeting on a boat and river outside Changsha, and they discuss all these things about, about government and everything else. And Lin had been to Xinjiang, and so Zhao was really interested in life out in Xinjiang and, and the environment there and his you know, strategy and stuff. And so later in his life, and interestingly enough, Lin and others had previously argued that Xinjiang should be a formal province of the Qing dynasty, right? And so, which is what Zhao will push later. 
right? and eventually he'll help create it. Um, and so, uh, so this is another like really seminal moment. And I should mention, for those of you who don't know, in addition to their personal contacts, as might be expected, all these literati, they intermarry their kids. So like Zaw's kids are married to the daughters or granddaughters of other officials. And like Lin Zexu's daughter was married to, I think, Zaw, Zaw's son maybe. And, and his, or his son or his daughter was married to Guo Song Tao's son. And so there are all these intermarriage connections between them. And later, Wei Guang Tao, who was the nephew of Wei Yuan, was in uh, Zaw's Mufu. And he, was, and he wrote one of the primary sources on the Bet Wars in Xinjiang in the, in the 1870s. So all these personal family connections in this, right? And so, um, so what will eventually happen is a Taiping Rebellion kind of breaks out, moves into Hunan, and um, Zhou was he got a reputation as being a sort of military strategist. Because in addition to geography and stuff, he read military classics, he read all kinds of historical works, et cetera. And so um, he joined the staff of Zhang Liangji, and he coordinated the, coordinated the successful defense of Changsha against the Taiping rebels. And, um, and so this was one of the first kind of, the Taipings are kind of blowing through different parts of Guangxi, et cetera. This is one of the first successful defenses of a major city was the siege of Changsha. So this really helps Zhao's reputation as a commander, as a strategist, et cetera. And, and it's sort of semi-official, right? He's, he's basically in a mufu at this point. He doesn't have a regular position in the Qing hierarchy. Um, and, um, but then uh, Zhang will get transferred somewhere else. I think he's transferred to Shandong. And Zhao doesn't want to go that far away because he doesn't want to leave his family when there's all this rebellion raging in Hunan. And so he goes back to Changsha for a while to stay with his family. And then Luo Bingjiang, another friend of Hu Lin-i and, and uh, Zhang Langji and all these people, they're all connected, right? Another friend of his brings Zhao back into service to fight the Taipings and join his Mufu now to fight the Taipings in Hunan. And so they do a number of different things in this period, in the early, early to mid 1850s. They are heavily involved in the defense of Hunan against the, uh, against the Taiping rebels. And uh, among the other things, among the things they do is they create a riverine navy to battle the Taipings, because early on, one of the secrets of Taiping success was mobility on the rivers. And so Zhao and others are like, we need a navy. They also say we need more modern firearms. So among other things, Zhao procures firearms, starts putting them on, putting small caliber cannon on, on boats to use for riverine patrols. They start coordinating amphibious defense. I, I wrote an article about this, so if you want real details on the riverine warfare. The Journal of Chinese Military History this past June I've got an article about it. But so Zhao is involved in this. He he also gets he gets tasked with setting up a bureau for cannon manufacturing. So he updates the so-called mountain splitter cannon, and there are various other uh, cannon firearms that he's involved with producing. This is in Hunan, and um, and then later he will be involved with the creation of the Xiang Army, and then uh, sort of subordinate of it, the Chu Army that he commands. Of course, Zhang Guofan is also part of this. You know, this group of people who are, who are doing this. And, um, and then another thing he stresses from the very first battles in Changsha is he says the problem is like, even if we take these lands back, the Taipings are gonna come in again and retake them if we don't clean up administration. He goes, we need to provide you know, f tax relief, food, shelter, improve the infrastructure, get business going again. He, he talks about all these things that you need to rejuvenate society at the local level, get rid of corruption. That's what he's, he's always harping on corruption, trying to get rid of corrupt officials and these sorts of things uh, throughout this. And, and he will, and as he's doing this, right, he's sending letters to uh, various other officials about this, complaining about maladministration and people siphoning funds and stuff. And he also writes letters to his sons, like study hard, you know, learn Confucianism, these, these sorts of things, like learn the classics. These are the keys. It's really interesting to read those. All right, so here's an, here's an image of the, um, of the Shang army. You know, so notice the firearms and things. And it's uh, sometimes uh, sort of erroneously uh, noted that it was the Westerners who come in in the 1860s that kind of introduced modern drilling and weaponry, et cetera, to the Chinese forces. But in fact, this predates that by about eight to 10 years. Right, they were already integrating as many Western firearms as they could, uh, cannon, uh, small arms, et cetera, and, and doing different drilling formations. So interestingly enough, one of the inspirations for both uh, Zhuo and Zheng Guofan was Qi Ji Guang, the, the Ming general who wrote all kinds of manuals to fight the Japanese 
in the, uh, in the 1550s. And of course, those methods were then translated to Korean to fight the Japanese in the 1590s. So uh, interesting connections there. And so this is, this is battling the Nian. So, uh, so essentially, uh, eventually Zaw will get, will get regular government positions and he will be promoted you know, up through the ranks. He eventually becomes governor general of uh, Zhejiang. And so he is associated with the recovery of Hangzhou and Zhejiang and the Taiping Rebellion. And then later he will be tasked with wiping out the Taiping remnants. So a lot of people don't really know this, but even after the fall of Nanjing, 200,000 Taiping troops sweep down into Fujian and Guangdong. And Zhou is the one who wipes them out. Right? He's the one who is tasked with wiping them out. And, and, and so as soon as he does that, he does that, then he sets up the Fuzhou Navy Yard. With, uh, with French help, they, they build the first modern shipyard or whatever in uh, Fujian. But before he can really even start administering that, the court says, you have to come and take care of the Muslim revolt in uh, Shanxi. And so he's like, okay, so he has to leave. He's wiped out the Taipings. He's set up a shipyard. Now he's got to go fight the Muslims. On the way to fight the Muslims, they're like, oh yeah, by the way, the, the Nian have gotten worse. So can you take care of the Nian rebels first and then deal with the Muslims? And so this is a picture of the Qing battling the Nian rebels in the, uh, in the 1860s. And so quickly, right, the Nian centered in northwest and central China. They, of the, of the late Qing rebels, they are the ones who are the most like a traditional roving bandit like you see in the late Ming. They don't really have a social program. They're, they're various leaders of different kind of gangs, but there's you know, a couple of prominent people, but if you kill one, it doesn't really matter. Right? You've got to kind of wipe them all out. And so a lot of guerrilla warfare moving, moving back and forth. In, uh, in different areas in society. Uh, when the, when the, the, they work off and on with the Taipings in the 1850s and 60s, some of the Taiping generals who escape, they go to the Nian after the Taiping capital falls in 1864. And so eventually, Zhao will be tasked with kind of wiping them out. And he will work, uh, initially he wants to use battle carts and try to constrict their mobility in the Northwest. That doesn't prove to be feasible, so they, they, they bring in more mobile troops. And then together, he and Li Hongzhang work together to eventually kind of encircle the Nian, force them into the rivers and canals of northeast China, like Shandong and Henan. And literally, like the last Nian leader, they drown in a, in a river when they, in uh, north, uh, southwest, uh, southwestern Shandong in 1868. And this is after the Nian are all over the place. They, they actually linked up with the, with the Muslim rebels for, for a brief time. But uh, Zhao manages to, to knock them out as well. But, uh, what's my time like here? Okay, I want to get to the heart of the talk here. So, so the Dungan might be a little less well known to people than these other rebellions, right? It's the, uh, the big Muslim revolt in uh, Northwest. And so I've got a map coming up. I uh, probably should have put the map first, but anyhow, again, uh, one thing I'll say, which is you know, quite interesting about this and ties into Zoa in general, is that the, um, when you study Zhao Zongtang, it's very interesting to see how his evaluation in China has evolved over the last several decades. So when you read stuff published in the 50s and early 60s about him, he was a, he was a class enemy, a running dog who suppressed peasants and you know, worked, with, worked with the landed gentry class. He and Zhang Guofan and these others were you know, Qing lackeys and bad for suppressing peasant rebellion and things like this. Later, uh, more recently, however, that has changed, right? So now, um, and, and that change starts in the 1980s and go more towards a nationalist hero. And so now they emphasize his efforts on behalf of the unity of the Chinese nation and keeping Xinjiang and creating the province of Xinjiang and creating Taiwan, which is also involved in the creation of Taiwan as a province, and then you know, preserving the, 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 the people together, as well as his concern for the common people. And, um, and his, uh, you know, his, his military exploits, his fighting off the Russians in the Ely crisis, his battling the French in the Sino-French War. So now Zhao is a hero again for all these things for Chinese unity. And they tend to, the, the, you know, the execution of uh, Muslim rebels or Taipings, they tend to 
that's sort of swept under the rug to emphasize his more patriotic dimensions and aspects as one of the leading lights of Chinese nationalism and the Chinese people. And so it's a really interesting uh, development and how that. And also quite interesting for the purpose of this particular rebellion, and I will say this about the Chinese communist uh, historiographers, uh, whatever you might think about the historiography under the PRC, the, uh, the researchers in the early decades, say 50s through early 80s, really did uh, researchers a solid when they were studying peasant rebellion because they gathered tons of material on peasant revolts from the Ming and Qing and all these different periods. And fascinatingly enough, they also did oral histories. And so for me, like the only time I've ever used an oral history was I stumbled upon a collection of oral histories of people in Shanxi re recalling the Dungan revolt that the Chinese communists had conducted these interviews in the 50s. And then finally they published this book of these interviews in the 1980s. And, and I found it on Amazon of all places. I was doing some kind of search and this book from a Chinese publisher popped up on Amazon. And I paid the 60 bucks, even though it was like 15 renminbi, but I paid the 60 bucks US to get it. And it's a really fascinating source because they're interviewing peasants in the 50s in Gansu and Shanxi about their or their parents, like what did their parents tell them about the Dungan revolts? And they go to all these different sites and these, these old mosques and these steles that were erected by the Qing and, and other things and you know, memorials and stuff. So it's really an interesting, like on the ground view of how the Dungan rebellion was remembered at that point in time, right? And so that gets into sort of what happened with the, with the Dungans. So the Dungans are the Chinese Muslims, also called Hui, um, and they are the non, in a simple sense, the non-Turkic Muslims are generally called Hui, although the Chinese sometimes use that term for everybody, like the Qing or the Han, some, every Muslim are called Hui, but generally they refer to the ones who live in China proper as Hui, and the others get some other designation, but, um, but um, depending on where they're from. But you know, Dungan is how they usually refer to those in Shanxi and Gansu. And, um, so what had happened throughout the 19th century is that there had been assorted tensions between Muslim and non-Muslim, both in you know, Shanxi and Gansu and also in Xinjiang. And periodically, and part of this is caused by the militarization, part of it is caused by the, the nature of Qing administration, which was pretty light, and they would appoint local Muslim leaders that they called begs to kind of run things for them. As long as they submitted taxes, they could kind of do what they wanted. But these people sometimes were very corrupt and abusive towards you know, Han and Muslims under their charge. And so there were a lot, uh, there were a lot of cases of, of violence, um, you know, sometimes religious, sometimes not. Um, and essentially, there were also different groups of Muslims who sometimes you know, conflicted with each other, but also conflicted with local Han. And so the way the Chinese uh, sort of identified the major groups in Shanxi and Gansu is the old teachings and the new teachings. Right? And so the old teachings are called uh, Gudimu in Chinese, Kadim. And so they are known as the silent ones because they, um, they emphasize active participation in, in uh, society, silence at funerals, veneration of saints and tombs, but were generally located in specific villages where a mosque would be kind of the center of village life. And so those are the, those are the old teachings who the Qing will then describe as the good Muslims. Right? The others are known as the new teaching Muslims, the Xinjiao, and they come from Yemen. They're, it's a Naqshbandi Sufi sect that migrates from Yemen, and they are more charismatic. They do vocalization at funerals. They wear long, elaborate beards. They are harder to track and control, and they, they travel along the different uh, trade routes from Western China out into Central Asia and to the Middle East. And so they, and they had started revolts in the, uh, in the Qianlong era, and so they were always kind of regarded with suspicion by the Chinese and sometimes by the old, the old teaching Muslims. So this is kind of the background, the Muslim background, a simplified version of it. Well, the revolt itself starts, supposedly there had been rumors across Central Asia and Northwest of ethnic cleansing of Muslims, that the, that the Qing were gonna shi them and, uh, and wipe them out. And so amidst this, a bunch of Muslims buy bamboo poles in this village in Shanxi, and the Han thought that they were buying poles to make weapons, and then they supposedly didn't have permission to cut down the bamboo in a particular forest. And so a Han mob goes to this Muslim village and kills them all and burns the village down. 
And so then the Muslims respond in kind, and next thing you know, you've got fighting springing up among these armed bands all over Shanxi. And, um, and then this is the beginning of the Dongan Revolt, which will last for 16 years in Shanxi. And it's, it's connected to, as I said, these rumors of ethnic cleansing. Of course, there were also rumors that the Manchus were going to cleanse everybody. It was what, Shen, Shen Hui Ho Han. <laughs> They're going to get them all. And, um, you know, these, these, so the different sources are, argue about this. But there, was, there were definitely tensions in the militarization of society. And the breakdowns of the Qing state are also important because by this point, you've got an uprising that starts here in 1864. It starts in Xinjiang. And of course, the Qing have slightly bigger things to deal with, with the Taiping and the Nian and the Arrow War a little before that, right? So they've got all these other problems. So it really allows these things to fester out in the Northwest. So Zhao will eventually go in after he wipes out the Nian, and, and he again will argue that the key is you know, to you know, rehabilitate society and kind of separate these groups. And, um, and so he will have all these different things, and he says he does not inherently hate the Muslims. He says they're only good and bad people. He reiterates this numerous times. But he also says so many Han hate the Hui. You know, they have boogeyman stories and everything else. He goes, that I think what we really have to do is separate them. The Hui get their own areas. The Han will be in their own areas. And so one of his big arguments is we need to relocate. But also, he says, if we relocate the Hui, we can't give them nothing. They need tax relief, they need seeds, they need animals, they need tools. And these are the things we have to provide. Problem is, is like, so this is his approach, but by this point, the rebellion has been going on for a while and, and other commanders have been fighting it. And so things have gotten worse and worse you know, between the Han and the Hui. And you've got old teaching, new teaching Muslims on either side. And, and the, the Muslim rebels, who are the new teaching people, they will really dig themselves in, literally and figuratively, in these fortresses around northern Shanxi. So their main base, which is Fort Jinji in, I guess, northeast Shanxi, they have 500 outlying bases, tunnels, fortifications out there that are surrounding it. And so when Zhao gets into Shanxi, he's like, okay, we need to, and it, it is strategy is, it, it's sort of like Chiang Kai-shek's annihilation strategy, but Zhao's actually works, um, is that you know, we will surround them piecemeal and work our way up to, uh, to Fort Jinji and finally take them. And so he brings in a bunch of his Hunan soldiers to do this, uh, most notably Liu Songshan, again, uh, who was a, a military officer from Hunan, and his uh, nephew, Liu Jintang, and what happens as the, uh, as the war goes on is they get close to, uh, to taking the, the innermost fortress of Fort Jinji. Liu Songshan is killed in battle. He's hit by a cannonball and dies in the field. And of course, in true fashion, if you read the sources, like his dying words to his men were, hide my death and keep fighting, right? Don't let them know I'm dead. Um, but they find out he's dead. And, um, and the Qing have to pull back. And so rather than abandon the entire campaign, Zhao says, put his nephew in charge, Liu Jintang. He's young, but he's smart, and the, the troops like him. So that's what they do. They elevate this young guy, like in his 20s, to become the commander of the army that, that is battling the Muslim. It takes over another year, but they finally take the, the city of, uh, 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 the fortress of Jinjibao. And then Zhao will systematically attempt to ally with the old teaching Muslims, like get more of them on his side and provide them with different incentives to side with the Qing. And um, in one famous episode they're taking, I think it's Hezhou, the, they, the Muslims actually win a big battle, ambush Zhao's forces, but then when Zhao pulls back, he sends out a negotiator and the Muslim leader there, Ma Janao, supposedly says, it doesn't matter, like we can't beat them, like they will just send more and more. It is better to save my people by allying with the Qing. And, and that's what he does. And then he and his descendants become warlords that end up living, like controlling parts of, Shin, or parts of uh, Gansu up until the communists take over. So it was actually a good move by, on his part. But um, so they will, do this, uh, they will do this alliance and then in the aftermath they will go in and Zhao will attempt to implement his policies, right? He will, uh, he will relocate Muslims to different places. He will, um, he will ask the government to outlaw the new teachings which they do in Shanxi, but not elsewhere. They outlaw it there, but they don't outlaw it empire-wide. Um, he will provide tools, money, seeds, draft animals to the different Muslim groups. He will set up schools 
uh, well, they will teach them the Confucian classics. He said, we need to acculturate them in Chinese so they can take the exams and then become officials of the Qing state, and we can make this state more like China. He goes, we got to make this more like China proper. We have to properly integrate this. So he sets up schools. He sets up a publishing house, sets up a woolen mill. He uh, attempts to eradicate opium production, replace it with silk production and uh, cotton. So he, he does all these different things to try to upgrade local society. Most of them were of limited effectiveness, but there, are, there definitely were some Muslim students. He also says that one of the things we need to do is so that they understand all directives should initially be written in Arabic, and we should have local Ahong who speak Arabic and Chinese, who are intermediaries in these places, so that they can properly buy Chinese civilization. And he says, you know, when we do this, they'll, they'll naturally see the superiority of Chinese civilization, and of course, they'll buy in, and, and everything will be good. Um, that doesn't exactly happen, but that is sort of his, uh, that's his goal. So I want to jump to Xinjiang real quick. So this is, uh, this is a map of all these things. So there's Jinjibu there. Um, and then you can see like the whole battle for Xinjiang. And that's Jakob Beg's uh, territory out there in the uh, west, in the far west. So. And this is, um, this, is a, uh, this is a period piece. What happened is there was a Russian embassy, a trade embassy that went through uh, Xinjiang in the late 1870s after the revolt because they were looking to uh, push their trade ties with China because they had occupied the Ely Valley. And they took a lot of photos and these photos were later sent to the Prince of Brazil or something and, and ended up in the Library of Congress. And so I, I was able to get a bunch of these for the book. And so these are pictures of some of these cities after the Dungan uprising. Now, according to the statistics, uh, it's the, these were incredibly bloody affairs. Some argue that 90% of the Muslim population of Shanxi and Gansu was wiped out. Uh, 800,000 to under 100,000, or some people say 15 million to 1 million of population as a whole in these areas. They're, the figures are not clear, but a lot of people were killed in these wars. A lot of Han died too. But, um, and the Muslim population at the time was about 30% of the whole population Muslim in these areas. And so here's Sujo after pacification, Sujo farther in the Northwest. Here is uh, the armies. I like the dog in the front. And so the Qing armies in formation. And there are other photos of actually Qing camps and stuff. You got the cannon and stuff there. And so meanwhile, and I'm, I think I'm running out of time, aren't I? Um, meanwhile, uh, out in the west, there's a Tajik ruler, a guy named, uh, known as Jakob Beg, who, uh, as a result of other things going on with the uh, state of Kokand, and uh, other developments in Central Asia, eventually decides to move into China. He, he gets sent as an assistant of someone else to raid into Kashgaria. He deposes, he's a commander, he's a general, he deposes the leader, takes charge himself, and essentially becomes the emir of Kashgaria, and, and basically becomes an independent ruler in far western Xinjiang. And uh, in, the, in the course of setting up his state, he will negotiate with both the Russians, who had battled before, and the British to get diplomatic recognition to buy weapons. He will end up getting about 2,000 cannon from the Ottoman Sultan um, and, have, and cut various deals with both of those. And, um, and so then the Qing have to decide how to respond. And it's very complicated. I'm running out of time. So I will I'll just say there's a big debate at court over whether or not the Qing even respond at all. Uh, Li Hongzhang's support, Li Hongzhang and his supporters argue that coastal defense is more important. Who cares about Xinjiang? He says it's a worthless desert. We don't need it. We don't want it. Let it go. It's nothing but a money drain. Zhao and his supporters argue that Xinjiang is vital to the defense of China because if we give up Xinjiang, the Russians will come. The British will come. You know, everybody will come because if, if Xinjiang falls, you know, if, he's a, if Urumqi falls, then Hami falls. Next thing you know, the Russians are in Beijing, right? And this is the argument that Zhao Zongtang makes and, and his supporters make, you know, for the, for the uh, step defense. And Zhao also, then he plays the Manchu ancestry card of all things. And he tells, how could you Manchus give up this land that your ancestors conquered? 
right? Are you real Manchus? And, um, and, so, and, and so this apparently was enough to convince them and Sushi, who basically has the decision-making power, right? Sushi backs him and backs off. And uh, so he will extensively plan for years. He will wrangle money from all over the place. Gets a huge loan from HSBC. Um, he also f manages to convince the Russians to sell them grain, even though there's a famine in Russia. <laughs> the, the Tsar, which is probably why he was assassinated, right? The Tsar sells grain to China to, uh, for this campaign against uh, Jakob Beg. In the meantime, the Russians had occupied the Ely Valley in the beginning of this period, in 1871, to protect their interests, and, and they were gonna give it back to China, they said, and that leads to another crisis later. But Zhao will manage to, uh, to successfully, and against all kind of odds, you know, Western observers at the time thought that, they, they called Jakob Beg the greatest soldier, in a, the greatest Asian soldier since Chinggis Khan. And they're like, you know, the Chinese have no chance against him. He's, he's a brilliant strategist, et cetera, et cetera. And so Zhao plan, plans for years, builds up his military, buys a bunch of guns from Krupp, and gets German advisors in there and stuff to help him, you know, carefully plans his routes of attack, does all these other things to make sure that he has, you know, basically Sunza type stuff, right? Make sure you can win. And so he spends two, three years building up his forces. They go through, they steamroll Jakob Beg. The, the, the rebels don't win a single battle. Jakob dies. The Qing say he takes poison in despair. Uh, it's likely from the uh, surviving accounts that he had a stroke. Um, and, and died because of that. But the Qing managed to steamroll him, and again, Zhuo will try to implement these same programs of renovation. He will expand irrigation. He will plant trees, willow trees, from Gansu out into Xinjiang, some of which supposedly are still there today, but plant like roads of trees and do all this irrigation uh, projects and all these other things. They will elevate you know, lo local loyal Muslims to positions of authority. They, uh, among other things, they erect uh, martyr shrines for any Muslim that died on behalf of the Qing. They'll put a martyr shrine up for them, like scatter them across Xinjiang. And, um, and again, he will attempt to um, you know, acculturate, like building schools. He builds all kinds of schools, publishing houses, other things, same stuff he does elsewhere. And then he will push for the creation of Xinjiang as a province, as a real province, right? Because it had just been a territory under the Qing with, with, with all that that meant in terms of you know, revenue, prefectures, districts, et cetera, right? To really provincialize it. And um, as an account of, of his success, and this is for, this is for Parr here, right? his assistant writes this poem about, about Zaw's success, right? There are some of ability and distinction. He's, he's talking about the Muslims here who are learning Chinese culture, right? There are some of ability and distinction who rise above the mob's foul reek. Their intelligence is no less than that of Li Bo. They finish their outlandish books and study Chinese writing. All right, so he's talking about the, the overwhelming success of his acculturation program, right? But uh, here we go. This is this is a contemporary image of Jakob Beg. And there are all kinds of accounts of him, and there's even uh, contemporary British accounts that have been preserved, republished. So you can, you can go on Amazon and buy a biography of Jakob Beg that's, a 19th, that's written in 1878 from the British perspective. It's really interesting. In fact, Zoua was considered, some of the British actually thought that Zoua was Manchu because he seemed to be so close to the Manchu, what they called the Manchu party at court as opposed to Li Hongzhang, where they said Li Hongzhang is the Han party and so is the Manchu party, but obviously so is not Manchu, right? But, um, so I got some more images here, as uh, Qing dragon cannon from the, uh, from the era. And there's a Muslim woman in Hami. <coughs> and this is a minaret in Hami after the war. So, and this is the uh, statue of Zhuo that was put up in, the, in around 2014 in his hometown of Xiangyan. Right. And so, um, so the original title of my book is More Than Just Chicken, but the, uh, the, uh, the publisher didn't like that, so that's the title of the conclusion now. Uh, they, they, they didn't know if everyone would get that, so I had to change it. Um, but uh, so uh, the kind of main points, right? Statecraft, tradition, self-strengthener, but also conservative, right? So he was a conservative modernizer. And it's fascinating, and I do this in the book, how many of his ideas are the exact same as what you see from the Meiji government later? 
right? The same sorts of arguments and strong navy, strong army, natural resources are our foundation. We have to build these up to defend ourselves, right? And we need modernization with tradition. I talked about his reputation, concern for the people. Finally, the Hunan Mafia, which I, that's literally what I call him in the book. Zhao's protégés totally dominate Northwest China for the rest of the Qing Dynasty. Like 70% of the ranking officials in Xinjiang, after it's made a province, were from Hunan. And most of them were directly connected to Zhao, either by marriage or you know, personal friends or whatever. So it's amazing how important these, and I know Stephen Platt has talked about this, other people have written about this, but amazing how important these Hunan people are in the Qing restoration or you know, modernization effort. Right, and just so many of them. I mean, at one point, it's like six of the eight governor generals in, in the Qing at the, and towards the end are, are from Hunan. <laughs> so, I mean, just really. And, and another thing is, Zhuo was the first uh, commander of Xinjiang to be of Han uh, descent. All the previous supreme commanders were either Manchu or Mongol. So he's the first Han commander. And he's also the, the most powerful official in the history of the Qing to be only a Juren, right? except for the people that he appoints. So the first governor of Xinjiang is Liu Jintang, Zhang's, uh, Zhao's general. Right? He's the first governor of Xinjiang in 1884. And, um, and so obviously very important. And then, of course, contemporarily, the, uh, the, uh, the Muslim issue of Xinjiang. Right? One, of the, one of the side effects of, the, of these massive uh, destruction campaigns is that the Uyghurs become more prominent in Xinjiang because the other Muslims are killed. And so they move farther east and farther north, and then they later create a narrative of you know, Uyghur nationalism, et cetera, that is part of the you know, stuff that's going on today. And, and because a lot of the old records, the previous you know, land records, et cetera, were destroyed in the wars of the 19th century between the Qing and these other different groups. And so, um, so that's another interesting sort of after effect of, uh, of what goes on there. Mm. But I think I will stop there because I'm probably over time, and I'll take questions. Yes, he, he, he almost, I don't know if he uses, he almost uses that terminology. I mean, and he talks about, we got to repair infrastructure, we got to repair trust, we need to give them something to not get them to go back, to, to not oh, go against I'm us. I'm thinking of stuff that would relate directly, for instance, to Islam. Mm -hmm. So the Qing uh, used Buddhism with a lot of Central mm -hmm. Asians, right? But I don't, don't remember any instance where there uh, well, were they using Islam? Islam? Well, yeah. you know, basically, his his feeling is that that it, it, with the respect to the new teachings, he explicitly says these are like white lotus. Get rid of them, mm -hmm. right? They're evil. He says the old teaching Muslims are okay, but they do put limits on them. Like you, you cannot fortify mosques. You can only have one mosque per village. There are all these other sorts of things he does. And so he expresses the fact that he says, well, you know, he has some sympathy, but he clearly believes that Han civilization, you know, Confucian mm -hmm. civilization is superior. And, and the idea seems to be that, well, he has some sympathy for them, they would be better off if they just converted to Confucianism and, and assimilated properly and, and did their, you know, and contributed to the empire in that way. So he does talk about the need to kind of have mediators and things and, and keep people loyal, but he's not, he, he definitely is not somebody who's pushing like, he's a, don't just wipe them out, but he's not really pushing for it either. If, if it seems to be like, and I think I call it, uh, I use the, uh, the American benevolent assimilation, that the Philippine approach, right? That's kind of, I, I use that term in the book too. I said, Zaw is kind of benevolent assimilation of the Muslims that it'll just kind of happen and then it'll be okay. 
And, and, and it's interesting because he goes back and forth. There are times where he seems very sympathetic, other times where he does seem pretty negative and say, well, you know, they've got the bees, the, they've got the nature of wolves and sheep, and what are we going to do with them? And, you know, it, but then he'll go back and say, well, they're people too. You have to understand, they, just, they have their families, and we have to protect that. But it's more from the imperial perspective, right? We've got to protect that to maintain order, to get supplies and things to strengthen the empire. So for me, Huawei Hui has kind of a negative connotation. Did he try to tamp down the use of that term as opposed to Huawei? Um, they generally, I think the, the, the term that you generally see in the accounts are, is just Huawei, hmm. not Huawei, Hui, it's just Huawei. Right. Yeah. That would come up in oral uh, yeah. conversations with folks. So harder. Yeah. At least it didn't have like a dog radical. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah. yeah. So uh, you mentioned uh, the distinction between Han and Hui. Uh, so Hui, uh, that, that they wouldn't make any distinction. So does this uh, Hui include uh, Uyghurs? Or does it make the Taranchi versus the Dungan distinction? Or Yeah, they generally that do that. Well? Exactly. They generally, and, and this is something that I didn't talk about today, but it's in the book. Because what happens is in the Yaakob Beg revolt, initially, like, the Hui work with the, with the Turkish Muslims. Right, and revolt. And then they, at some point, they kind of turn on each other. And so then more of the Hui end up siding with the Qing. And in fact, what ends up happening to Jakob Beg is that he becomes, he's like this hardcore, you know, Islamicist who wants to, to impose more of a kind of Sharia law. And it pisses off all the, the Muslims that were already there. And they start saying, well, God, the Qing were better than this. Like, we don't want this guy in charge. Like, he's, he's you know, stifling us and he wants us to do all these, you know, observations and become much more religious than we were. And, and that actually, he actually, they get, they turn against him. And, and so there, it's not a unified Muslim bloc by any means. And, but the Qing make distinctions between them, and, and so do the groups themselves. And so like the first people that revolt in Xinjiang are actually Hui. They're, they're two, Chinese, two, ha, or two Chinese people that revolted in Rumchi. And then Jakob Beg kind of comes in and sort of gets involved with them. And initially they work together. Then they turn on him. And so then they work for the Qing instead of him. So. But they, they make that distinction. And, and I didn't talk about there's a lot. There's also distinctions between the different Turkish Muslim groups. There's the black hats and the white hats. And one of them is connected to the Dalai Lama. And there are all these other sorts of permutations in it. But I, mean, I didn't have enough time today. So I got the simple version. Can you comment a little bit about current views of General Zhou in, uh, in contemporary China? Well, as I said, it's, it's interesting because in the last 50, because his birthday is 200, the 200th anniversary of his birth was 2012, right? And so in the last 15 years, there have been a ton of biographies in Chinese, like modern Chinese published about him, and, and pretty much all pretty laudatory. And, and one in particular is very interesting because it's, it really explicitly compares him and Li Hongzhang and, and, and cast Lee in an extremely negative light. You know, Lee was greedy, avaricious. You know, when Lee died, he was the richest man in China. You know, he had a personal fortune of like 20 million tails or something. Where when Zhao died, he had a personal fortune of 20,000 tails. Like they specifically say this in the book. And like anytime, like Lee always, always wanted to, Lee, Lee believed that what was good for him was good for China. Where Zhao believed what was good for China was good for China and was more about you know, working with the people and, and this sort of nationalist figure. And, and it's interesting because he's connected to both the big things, right? The recovery of Xinjiang, but also he pushed for the creation of Taiwan as a province. So you could, and then he fought for Taiwan, you know, to defend Taiwan in the Sino-French War. So Zhuo checks all the proper nationalist boxes at this point. Plus he was a, he was a scientist, right? And, and so if you want to talk about science and technology and modernization, he supported that. And um, so it, it, generally nowadays, it's, it's much more positive 
than it was in the early communist era. And, and they really, I mean, because there were some, there were a couple of early communists that really went after him for his suppression of the peasant revolts. And then there was a book published in Taiwan, I can't, 60s maybe, that really went after him for his Muslim suppression, basically said he practiced genocide against the Muslims. And just really, in the new accounts tend not to, they talk about it, but they said, well, this was in the aim of national unity, and, and you know, that's what's more important. Right, and the unity of the people, not the specific Muslim thing. So I, I, just a f uh, question about the parallels between Japan, Meiji Japan, and Zotun Tang's reform. So one thing that you mentioned is that he kind of foreshadows uh, the uh, Meiji modernizers. But isn't there kind of a distinction, though, between the Meiji program? Because one thing that the Japanese modernizers uh, picked up from the West is that if you want to modernize, you need to be ruthless with your own traditions and demarcate precisely what you want and get rid of the rest. And the Meiji uh, reformers themselves, they were almost uh, getting into a cultural revolution mode when they, tore, they were just about to tear down a lot of shrines and things like that. And to me, and I would, would be happy to be proven wrong, Zotun Tang doesn't seem to have that ruthlessness towards his own tradition uh, uh, yeah. as much. So I wonder if you could elaborate a little yeah, bit. Yeah, well, it's funny. There's a whole section of the book that, that talks about this. And one of my main points is that you cannot compare Meiji Japan to Qing China. Actually, they're two different things because the Meiji is a post-revolutionary government. You compare the Qing to the Tokugawa. And I make this point again and again and again. And so actually, I use that because he does, like some of the things, like the rich country, strong army, he believes in that. But yeah, that is different. But that's why I also explicitly say, that I, I make this statement, but I say, I say people unfairly compare the Qing to the Meiji. You gotta compare the Qing to the Tokugawa. You don't compare the Qing to the Meiji. That's a different thing. Right? The Meiji was a, whole, was a revolutionary government. It was a modern state. It was a nation. The Qing is an empire. You compare the two. And then, and then Tokugawa, of course, falls apart in 15 years. Right? They had no respect for their traditions. <laughs> but, uh, so they're done. Right? Uh, Tokugawa were losers. But um, you know, they had nothing to deal with, practically. Compared to the Qing, they had nothing to deal with. But, um, but no, that's a good question. Yeah, and, and I, I want to be clear that I think Zoa presages a lot of their ideas, but definitely that tradition thing is not. I mean, he believes in the power of the tradition to renovate. But also, he, he's not, and it's interesting, because even the Western press in China at the time go back and forth with their opinion of Zhao. Like sometimes he's a pig-headed, anti-foreign, xenophobe, blah, blah, blah. Then at other times, he's the best leader in China. It's amazing, like month to month, how like the stories in the North China Herald, which I read a lot of, like how they evaluate the different figures. And they really have this thing about Zhao versus Li Hongzhang. Like they are, they are obsessed with the rivalry between those two. It comes up again and again in the North China Herald in particular. So, uh, but that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely, Meiji's different though. I say Meiji's a different animal. And so he, he anticipates some of them. But that's a, my point is that it wasn't that, because students too often say, well, China was traditionalist and hidebound and wouldn't change, and Japan would. But you gotta be, it's more nuanced than that, right? It's the Meiji did, the Tokugawa and the Qing were more the same. And there were Qing reformers who wanted, you know, greater levels of reform than they have, but the situation was so complicated with all these different factions. Of course, the Manchus, right? And this is what I also say to the students, is that you can't really blame the Manchus for not wanting to change, because they knew if everything they did was good, they were, good, they were done, right? The Manchus, they were right. Like, if they do all these changes, they're, they're eliminated. So on the one hand, you can kind of respect the Manchus for not wanting to do all that stuff, because they knew when, once we do all this stuff, we're done. We're, we're no longer the rulers, right? So. So uh, I, I kind of uh, you know, see that, and, and it's interesting to see the debates and, like, and, and how the different Manchus get into it too. You know, Prince Gong and some of these other people, obviously Sushi, Su'an, I mean, are, are all involved in this. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the talk. Yeah. So I'm wondering, did you pay attention to the, especially some contemporary Hui literature who also memorize, I mean, the whole Zuo and the whole, uh, I think from the, uh, the Donggan and also the Qing Jibao battle, uh, especially these two, yeah, because I thought it's interesting that, for example, they have more like a nuanced differentiation between the old teaching and the new teaching, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Gadim is definitely the oldest one, yeah. yeah. So even among the next band, there's the new one, it's kind of louder, mm -hmm. uh, which is Zhe yeah. I think the other one is like uh, Hu Fu, yeah, he's like, uh, 
it's more silent here than mm -hmm. Japan yet. Yeah. yeah. And then Ma Zhang Ao is actually the kind of the new teaching, uh, it's kind of the who fear, the silent one in the new teaching. Yeah. And then Ma Hua Long, the leader of the Jing Ji Pu, yeah. uh, is like the, uh, I think the louder one of the new teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. According to this kind of literature, I mean, the most famous one is probably Zhang Chengzhi, you know, the famous Hui novelist, uh, who is still quite radical and active in Kanabri China. Mm -hmm. uh, so in his narrative is super kind of a moral, is a moral narrative in the way that uh, Ma Huarong I think get treated by Zuo. Yeah, mm -hmm. So he basically say, hey, we are really under siege, but I want to sacrifice myself in order to exchange all my people, yeah. So he surrendered to Zuo, I think Liu Jintang actually, yeah. But then he got killed, and then all his people also got killed, mm -hmm. yeah. And the consequence of this memorization is also, it means Zuo is not the doing assimilation at all, yes. So later on, especially the Zhe Ye people, they still have like many revolts. And uh, even in the contemporary memorization, of Zuo, you can also see like a radical bifurcation. I mean, some people really think he's an asshole. I mean, oh, yeah. his strategy is always about cheating. Yeah. But the other is, of course, you know, the national unification narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not a specialist in Muslim history at all. <laughs> so, and I'm more interested in the Qing side of it. So I haven't really looked at that stuff so much. But I mean, what happens with, with Mao too, right? Or um, with uh, Ma Hualong, right? He's Mao Chao, Chao Qing for a while, right? He, he had already kind of submitted to the Qing. And then basically, as soon as he submits, he takes a new name, Chao Qing, right? Clean, clearing him, cleaning himself, right? Clean spring, whatever, clear morning, right? He takes a new name and he immediately, you know, rebels again. And, and gets all these guys to join him. And so what happened is when they finally get him to surrender, supposedly, and again, the, this is the Qing perspective, supposedly they, they have to turn over all their weapons and stuff. And then they find a cache of a thousand weapons hidden in his fortress. And so that's why they execute him. That's what they said. Right? I don't know if the, Muslim, the Muslims are saying that, but that's what the Qing say. And, um, and that's why they ended up executing him. But he had, he had, he had already revolted again after he had surrendered. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, but clearly because the Qing make a pretty clear distinction between what they see as the old and new teachings that, and, and Zhao, yeah, definitely was, those guys gotta go. And, and, he, and he explicitly uses the white lotus comparison, the Bai Lian Hui. He said, these guys are like Bai Lian Hui, Bai Lian Chao, they're the same thing. Where the other ones, there is more assimilation from some of the uh, Ma Jianao and his family and some of those others. But I didn't really look at the, the I, I tried to bring some of that in there, but I'm not a specialist in Muslim history at all. I do military stuff, so I'm more interested in the Qing side of it, but that's good. It's interesting to know that. I mean, I know Zhao so still has a negative reputation in, in some circles, but the dominant perception of him in China today is obviously as a hero, right? But that's a good point. Thank you. I have a question from the virtual audience. So this is a question from Eric Mugler. First, I want to say that I'm an admirer of your work. Your book on the Mingqing transition in the Southwest rocked my world. But at the same time, I think of that book and of your presentation today as being imperial history. That is, history from the point of view of the empire. I wonder how you might describe the overall style and emphasis of your work. What are you trying to accomplish? And how would you frame the politics of what you are doing? Uh, actually, we talked about this a little bit last night, right? My job is to bring the empire back in. Uh, too much micro history, too much little guy this. We need to bring the big man back. And, uh, and, and I do military history, right? And I'm looking at the perspective, I mean, and look at the, the kind of, you know, how the empire is constructed. I mean, for too long, this is my opinion, for too long in Chinese history, it was an empire without a military, right? How did they do all this if they didn't have military success and conquest? And how does this work with the creation of the Chinese state and empire? And actually, in, in response to Eric, the, the next book, which is about the Sanfan Rebellion, one of the working premises of that book is that this alliance between the Han and the Manchu actually starts during the war in the Southwest against the Ming loyalists, 
where Han officials are telling the Manchus that it's these Miao and these other minorities that are savages, and we need to work together to wipe out the savages and bring Chinese culture, right? And, and a guy to Gui Liu, right? They're going to bring in the, the districts and provinces and Confucian schools and all this other stuff. This actually starts with Wu Sangwe and his battling the Southern Ming. And then Wu sets up his own force, which is another sort of interesting thing. Um, and, and a lot of his force are actually former peasant rebels that were rebels under Zhang Xianzhong and Li Dingwa. They become part of Wu's force that then rebel against the Qing. And then the Sanfan Rebellion is this kind of linchpin where it really all kind of gets consolidated. And then this idea, then it becomes a springboard for the eventual Qing annexation of Tibet and Xinjiang and these other places because now you've created a new sort of type of imperium, a new view, and it's Han and Manchu kind of working together to do this. And that's why the Qing is so successful, in my opinion, is because they kind of combine these things of the, Chan bureauc the Han bureaucratic know-how, the Manchu sort of conquest, sense of empire, and it becomes a very, from the perspective of the empire, right, a very profitable partnership. And, um, and then you know, later it's interesting because in the 19th century, the, the Manchus are trying to hang on, and it's the Han officials who are the more aggressive parties when it comes to recovering Xinjiang. And then this eventually morphs into the Han nationalism that you see in the late 19th century. And um, I mean, Sun, uh, even Sun Yat-sen like references these earlier events and Lin Zexu and stuff as heroes of his. And, um, and I think Hong Xiu-chuan was also a hero of, of uh, Sun Yat-sen, supposedly. So, um, but definitely, Eric, yeah, uh, there is an imperial perspective that I'm bringing in, in, in terms of this and a sort of reaction against all this kind of local kind of micro histories and stuff. That is a good question. Did Zhuo have particular policies to deal with nomadism and porous borders that he's going to run into in the Northwest? He doesn't really talk about that much. It's, it's more about the regularization of administration. And, and, and they, they do see it as a graduated process. Um, but he's really interested in his big pitch to the Qing court is how the, one of the problems, one of the big arguments against making Xinjiang a province was that it was always draining money from everywhere else. It was too expensive to administer. It wasn't worth it. And his big pitch is we're going to irrigate and we're going to do all these things to get settled agriculture in here. He, another thing he does do is he stresses uh, animal husbandry, you know, sheep farming and stuff like this as a way to uh, kind of settle it and bring profitability uh, to that. And they do, but they also want to demarcate the borders. And I didn't talk about the Ely crisis at all, but that's a big part of the book because with Russia and sort of what they do there. And they do set up border checkpoints and put a bunch of fortresses along the walls and uh, along the frontier and things like this. But he doesn't really talk about the nomad issue so much. Although it's interesting, one of the things that also happens in this war against Jakob Beg that I didn't talk about is that they, they bring a lot of Mongols in to fight from, from the, some, the Alashan Mongols and some of these other groups get brought in by the Qing. So they like, okay, we got, because uh, Jakob Beg is like three, three cavalry for every infantryman he had in his army. His army is like 40,000 or something. And so they bring in Mongol cavalry to do this. Although most of the Qing, like, and their supply lines are all camels. They have like 30,000 camels they bring in to go through Central Asia and 5,000 donkeys and stuff like that. Okay, so with those words, uh, I wish to conclude today's uh, uh, meeting and uh, give uh, Council a warm applause, please.